I love this gathering of talks that we have been in. The God of the impossible. Anybody having a mindset shift in this series? I know for me, I can't stop thinking about uh, last week's talk and that one phrase that actually came from an architect and just affirmed everything that we already knew is true about our God. We are not limited by known solutions. That's how you build the tallest building in the world, by the way. That's how you do great things. That's how you uh, put a colony on Mars. That, that's how you do things that are outside the box. You're not limited by known solutions. And if we are walking with Yahweh today, if we're in worship, worshiping Yahweh today, then our mindset should be different and it should begin with it's possible. It's possible, why? Because I'm walking with the God of the universe and nothing is impossible with God. God does not want us just to share a collection of a few talks and then move on to the next thing in life. He wants to make a modification in the way our brains process life. And when things come our way, God wants us to start with possible, not impossible. And we talked last week, if we walk with Yahweh, why is it so often we start with, well, I can't see anyway. Why don't we start with God makes a way where there isn't a way. Therefore, I'm going to start with possibility and I'm going to start with a new mindset. But today I want to get down further into the tension because there was a little tension last week in Gethsemane. And if I went person by person in here today, I would guess there's tension in every story today. And tension's great in stories. That's why we love movies, because movies create tension. If there's no tension, you got no great story, you got no great movie, you're not interested, you've already jumped the channel and gone somewhere else. You want the tension. Is she going to make it? Are they going to get back together? Is it going to resolve? Somehow are they going to get off this thing and get onto this thing? Is the last guy going to make it? And the tension builds purposely through the entire story and then a great story eventually in the prequel to the sequel resolves the tension. Unfortunately, by then it's too late because a lot of us don't remember anything about the tension that got built, but some, you know, Uber fan is happy that the tension got resolved. But a great story builds tension and then wonderfully resolves the tension in a way that everybody walks away and feels pretty good about the deal. And I want to do a little bit of that work today because I feel like that in my life, and I'll just speak for me, in my journey with Jesus over many, many decades, this idea that there's nothing impossible for God has run into a lot of headwind. Can I get an amen from anybody? This idea that God is the God of the impossible has run in to some brick walls. And it's created tension that we don't talk about very often. But that God is very happy to talk about and that he's promising you, spoiler alert, that tension is going to be resolved in a phenomenal way. Because God is the God of the impossible. We see this play out in the book of Acts, and I want to dig into this text together, a text that most of us are very familiar with, but I want us to see in it the very thing that we're talking about, because it's not unique to your spiritual journey that you believe that God was the God of the impossible, but yet you ran into headwind that actually ran over you and left you in the dust. You're not the only person that that's happened to in life. And you're not the only person who's asked the question, I, I know God is great and I love God and I trust God, but how is it that God has allowed everything to get to this point? And you're not going to be the last person to ask that question either. And we see it all throughout the story of God in Scripture, particularly in Acts chapter 2, to catch us all up in case you didn't know, Jesus promised that if he went away, he would send a spirit. The spirit is now ready to arrive. And so the upper room is filled with the followers of Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes. Once he comes, he empowers people with boldness they've never had. And immediately one of them, Peter, stands up and preaches one of the most amazing sermons of all time, such that at the end of it, 3,000 people get saved. 
So this is a moment. We didn't even see church coming. We didn't know the Spirit was coming today. We didn't know we were preaching today. We didn't know 3,000 people were getting saved today. This is a God of the impossible. And in the middle of his message, this is what he says. And see if you can notice the tension in this moment. So he's preaching to insiders. He's preaching to Jews who've come into Jerusalem from around the known world for the festival. And so this group of people would have been in the entire story of what God is doing in bringing Messiah to bear. And so he calls them out directly. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. Now, just to put a little cool connection in there, the word miracles in this verse is the exact same Greek word as the word for possible that we've been talking about the last few weeks, dunamis. The power, the ability of God is the same word for miracles. So he's been exhibiting the ableness of God the ability of God, the power of God to exert his might on any circumstance. So this man, Jesus of Nazareth, was accredited by God. What does that mean? It means that this is the way that God was assuring to you that Jesus was the sent one of God by these miracles and by wonders and by signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. So he's kind of putting everybody on the hook here. But then verse 23, things really elevate to a spiritual atmosphere that we have to reach up for. Verse 23, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you... With the help of wicked men, now he's bringing in the the Roman government of the day and those who are the official rulers in the city, put him, Jesus, to death by nailing him to the cross. You feel how tension just came in right there? Lots of tension came in. A, we've got a person accredited by God who can do miracles, wonders, and signs, who now is in a situation that needs a miracle or a wonder or a sign, and it doesn't get any. Because God had a purpose, and that purpose was signed on to by evil men, and then Jesus is now put to death. So the whole story of walking on water comes to a screeching halt right here. But then eventually, we know the story unfolds differently and we see the tension resolve in verse 24. But, there's always a but as the tension is resolving, but God raised Jesus from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because here it comes, here here comes our, 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 our series, our collection. Because it was, say it with me, do you see it? It was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And then Peter reaches back because he has a Jewish audience who know the scriptures. And so he reaches back to connect all the dots for them. And he says, David said about him. And he's now referencing Psalm 16, one of the great texts for the story of of my life personally. I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Now, any of us can take up that promise of Psalm 16, but that Psalm we now know is specifically pointing to Jesus. And it's saying that no matter what happens and what tension is created, ultimately the end of Jesus' life is that he's going to be with God 
again as God, in the presence of God as God, uh, once again in the fullness of God, that God is going to restore all things. But in the middle, there is a lot of tension in the mix. And so where does this leave us? It leaves us with where we were in Gethsemane, starting with possibility, but surrendering in confident hope of God's ultimate plans for our lives. Luke 22, 42, in the ESV translation, Jesus prayed this, Father, if you are willing, some other translations and in other gospels, we saw if it is possible, but here he says, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And so what is God saying? He's saying, I know there's tension. And when there's tension, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray for the possible in the impossible. But I also want you to posture yourself to say, but nevertheless, not what I can see as the best outcome, but what you are already seeing as the best outcome. That's what I want. More than what I want, I want what you want to be done. And I love this particular translation. King James says the same thing. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. ESV picks it up. And I just want to underscore again today that when you pray, nevertheless, it's nevertheless. Hello? When I say to God, I believe it's possible... But nevertheless, your will, not my will, the outcome is never the less. Because God is working in the tension to resolve all the tension in his time. So while you're in the tension, what do you do? A couple of things. You remember, number one, that God is accomplishing his will in a flawed and failing climate. So God is doing something supernatural in your life right now, but he's doing it in a climate that is both flawed and failing. So he's operating inside of a decaying world, accomplishing restoration plans. In other words, God isn't working simply outside of time, although he is outside of time right now. He, he, he's, he's working in real time in your life right now, meaning he's working within a, a fabric of flawed and failing. That's why everything doesn't instantly look like what we think it should look like, because the space in which God is working is constantly failing because it's fatally flawed. And you have to remember that this is the context of life. Even with Jesus in Gethsemane, God didn't send a notice. He sent his son. He didn't work outside of the flawed and failing system and say, over here outside of the flawed and failing system, I'm going to work out a way to bring people back to me through some redemption plan. And then I'm going to notify them via text or email of what I've accomplished outside of time and space. No, he chose to enter inside of time and space and get in the messy middle, meaning it looked like a lot of times the whole plan hit a brick wall. But God was working, just working inside of a flawed and failing climate. Second thing you have to remember when the tension is building is that God supersedes the failed and flawed climate. In fact, he actually uses the failing climate to accomplish the impossible. I, I, this text is crazy. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of it is just stunning. But to say it again in verse 23, Jesus was handed over to you, not because you were clever and Judas sold him out for 30 pieces of silver, not because somebody tipped you off that he was in Gethsemane praying that night. That's not how you got to this end result. You got the, to this end result because this was the predetermined plan of God. God knew about this plan, had foreknowledge of this plan, and actually was determined that this plan would actually unfold. But for it to unfold... He needed the partnership of the flawed and failed climate. 
to work with the predetermined and foreknown plan so that then he could do the impossible and supersede the flawed and failed climate. Now, I don't, I don't know. That, you say that's not super practical. No, it's not super practical, but it's super transformational to remember that in every moment of life, God is possibly and probably using something failed and flawed to actually do something impossible that couldn't be done without God. And we oftentimes don't know what that was. I mean, there were Uh, disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, they had no clue what was going on. They saw the whole thing go down, but they had no clue what was going on. They were right there tracking along. They had no clue what was going on. They couldn't even stay stay awake to hear his prayer, to even kind of get a clue from his prayer what was happening. They didn't know that God was using something failed and flawed to do the impossible, that a guy was going to come in with a sword and try to take somebody's head off. While the creator of the universe, Yahweh, was crushing Satan underneath the feet of Jesus. I got a sword. I'm going to hurt somebody. And God's going, oh, gosh. He put his ear back on. Get a clue. I am working with a traitor to accomplish the impossible. The third thing you have to remember in the tension is that our present reality, this is what we've been saying, doesn't always affirm supernatural activity. I mean, anybody with me on this or is it just me over here in the tension? And so we we come in and we say yesterday, today, and forever, and it's 100% true. But then we turn right into the headwind of our situation and we're like, I don't see any yesterday, today, and forever. And so we have to have a change of a mindset that says my God is the God of the impossible. And just because my present reality doesn't affirm that, it doesn't mean that God isn't able. This for me is the tension of John 14, 11. I don't know if anybody has ever kind of tried to work your way through this tension, but Jesus is promising the Holy Spirit. He's talked about the great works that he's done, and then he tells his followers. You know this text? He tells them, hey, you're going to do, I'm going to go away to my Father, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, and you're going to do all the things that I do, and you're even going to do, does anybody know this text? You're even going to do, hello? Greater things. And so that's created tension in the whole church. They're like, where are the greater things? And I'm like, greater than what? Walking on water? What's greater than that? Walking on water with your best friend on your shoulders, balancing somebody on one hand. What's greater than Lazarus coming out of the tomb? Lazarus coming out on a unicycle, juggling 17 knives? I mean, what is greater? Is that not created tension for anybody? And I'm, I don't know of anybody who's walked on water. Personally. I mean, I'm not saying nobody has walked on water. I'm just saying I've lived 64 years and traveled around the world. I've never met anyone who said, yeah, so anyway, we walked on water. So where, where, where are we? And, and, and how do you resolve that tension? Well, I think, A, you start with the possible. So in every situation, you believe God for a miracle. Every single time. You start with the dunamis. You start with his ability and you lean into his ability and you, you believe that God is the God of miracles. I've seen God do miracles. Or I've seen God do things that had no known solutions. I don't know how they got happened, but they happened. And so I believe God did them. So I believe in a God of miracles because we've seen God do miracles. But there's also been moments in time where we prayed and we prayed and we didn't get what we prayed for. And in that same text, Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. Tension. Tension. And so is Jesus maybe putting us in a context of saying, see it all, watch it all, watch me through it all, come to the place of starting with the possibility, but then understanding that it's not 
the less to surrender in confidence that I'm working in and above what you can see and understand doing miracles even now. And maybe that the greater is that you and I have seen and been a part of and experienced exponentially more than these people could have ever even fathomed. I remember um, just listening to Christine at Passion preach about, at church here, preaching about Paul being shipwrecked on Malta. And I was thinking about the fact that he would have heard all of these eyewitness accounts of the stories of Jesus. Even though he wouldn't have had the gospels in his hands, he would have heard all the stories of what Jesus did. And so when the ship began to sink, he would have obviously just gone to sleep like Jesus did. But that's not what he did. So when the, the northeaster, as it says in Acts, picked up, he would have just spoke to it and said, be still, because even the wind and the waves obey him, and everything would have chilled. But he didn't do that. Or he would have just got out of the boat. <laughs> this is not good, but I'm going to walk short. But he didn't do that either. He didn't do any of the things that it seems like he would have done if he'd heard Jesus say that you can do whatever I did. He just got out of the boat and walked off. And just told the wind, okay, now that I'm out here, calm down. Or he would have just gone in the bottom of the boat and said, I'm just going to sleep this one out. Just like my Savior would have. But he did get a word from God. You want to see it? Verse 21. After the men had gone a long time without food. This is in verse 21 of Acts 27. Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, here comes the miracle. An angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me, nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Now, we know that when Paul got to the island and the snake came out of the fire, he just shook it off. And we know that he proclaimed the word of God and a revival broke out on the island. So we know that because of God's predetermined plan to bring a revival to this island, the ship had to sink. And men had to make really dumb decisions like, this is the wrong time of year to sail along this coast. But you know what? Seems like we got a little break in the action and a steady calm wind. Let's go for it. Until immediately that wind changed into destruction. And Paul says, hey, I told you guys in the first place that we shouldn't be sailing at this time of the year. But you insisted, so get ready. But be encouraged because my God, the God I serve, spoke to me last night. We're all going to make it. The ship's going down, so forget about the ship, okay? All this saving the ship business, that's over. But we're all going to be saved after we run aground. And then I'm going to preach a revival, and a lot of people are going to get saved. The uh, enemy is going to try to stop me, but I'm going to just shake him off. Oh, and then ultimately, uh, the story's going <laughs> to resolve. I'm going to go stay in trial in Rome, and then I'm going to die. God bless everyone. Let's have a good meal together. You see how God's working in all that tension. And it's both the possible, and it is surrender and confidence to the plans of God. And you and I are in a place in life where our present reality often doesn't affirm God's supernatural activity. So you're like, well, I wish an angel would come and talk to me. Well, if Paul had had this in his hands, he wouldn't have needed the angel to come and talk to him. Because this would have told him, don't be afraid. God is in control. 
I'll never forget that seeing this tension build. And I've, some of you have heard me tell this story, but a lot of you are new to passion. Uh, one day, 2003, we were doing a second outdoor event this time not in Memphis, but in Sherman, Texas, and, and toward the Metroplex of Dallas-Fort Worth area. And uh, I don't know, maybe 20, 30, 40,000 people are headed to this outdoor event. And this is pre-social media. You can't text people and let them know. And the night before the event was supposed to happen, tens of thousands of people maybe were already camping in tents. And I mean, a storm blew in so serious that um, we saw pictures of it later, just the radar image. It wasn't like the red and the yellow and the orange. It was the purple, you know, the real bad one. And the purple just sat on top of where we were for a while. People got struck by lightning. Tents got completely washed out. The entire farm we were on just turned into muck. And here we were, the leaders at about maybe eight o'clock in this tent that was set up as a uh, as sort of a backstage hangout area. And we were praying for the event as the wind began to pick up and the flaps on the tent began to fly in the air. And these were heavyweight spiritual leaders. If I named them, you would know all their names. And now the whole tent is catching a little bit of a draft and it's just the whole tent and the poles are going up. Big tent, by the way. <sighs> Not raining yet, just a little windy. And I will never forget how quickly we shifted into, in the name of Jesus, I speak against this wind. In the name of Jesus, I say, be still, wind. And I mean, you had all the horsepower and ammo you've ever seen coming out of people. And the, the more we proclaimed, the harder the wind blew until eventually it started pouring rain sideways into our faces. And we said, it doesn't matter. We walk by faith and not by sight. So to the rain, we say, be still. And to the, to the wind, we say, be still. To the circumstances, we say, we claim this ground. We claim this tent. And then a lightning bolt hit the ground about 80 yards from where we were praying. And every one of us ran as fast as we could <laughs> to get cover. It rained until morning and shut the whole thing down. Shelly and I spent the night on the floor of the camper we were staying in, sobbing to God and begging him to help us because we leveraged everything. And I'm telling you, the present reality did not affirm any supernatural activity of a God who promised me that if I would pray it in Jesus' name, it would be done. And that if the wind and the waves obeyed him, they'd obey me. You're like, well, what is the end of this story? Well, a few things. A, we actually had an event because the weather cleared and it wasn't Georgia and it wasn't red clay. It was a sandy soil of Texas and a steady wind blew down from Saskatchewan, Canada all day that came behind that monstrous storm and by evening it had dried the ground. The temperature dropped about 30 degrees but eventually, we don't know how many thousands of people would have turned around and gone home. Thousands of people had to go and sleep in a high school gymnasium. But eventually, 20 some odd thousand people showed up. And I remember Beth Moore standing up to speak and she said, well, we've been fasting and praying and asking God to show up. We just didn't realize how terrifying it would be when he did. And we had holy ground. You can finish that story on another day, but we went in the hole financially by a lot because of all of the circumstances that surrounded that. And God did a miracle of providing a few days later 
a six-figure gift to help us cover the gap. And then we came home and realized God did a miracle and covered the gap, but we didn't have any money left and so we weren't gonna be able to pay people. And then the phone rang and the guy said, hey, I'm really, this is gonna be an awkward conversation. And I was like, okay, what? He said, our foundation made a gift to one day and someone gave it to me and asked me if I would send it to you and it got under a pile of stuff on my desk and I just moved the pile and remembered the check. It's been sitting here for three weeks and it's for $75,000. I just wanna let you know that's what's coming. And I don't know, you know what the timing and how all that works and I just hung up the phone and I said, well, we're gonna be able to make payroll because of a check that's been sitting under a pile on a guy's desk that he forgot about for three weeks. So I don't know why the wind didn't stop when we told it to, but I have no doubt that God did exactly what he intended to do on that field. So you might not be walking on water, but God's still speaking to you. (laughs) Fear not everybody's going to make it through. Just two last things and we'll close. When the tension's rising, it's important that you remember that the bank of Yahweh is not going under. 2008, a lot of stuff went under. Do you remember that? And it went under because banks never anticipated everybody wanting their money on the same day. And so they took all of our money and then they used a fair amount of our money to go make other money so that when crisis came and people came to get their money, they didn't have their money and they went under. Well, good news, the uh, new regulations have changed that. And so supposedly, and I believe it, uh, banks are massively capitalized now in a humongous way. And they got enough money in there that if we all decided we need our money, we could all get our money. So that's good. But I'm not counting on any banks because you, you can only count on one bank and that's the bank of Yahweh. And that bank is capitalized at a level that should make you rest assured. Paul said it this way in his letter to Timothy. And when he was writing to Timothy, he was wanting to just encourage this young man in the faith. And he's wanting him to take heart and to take hope, even though Paul's in prison for the gospel. Paul's finally made it and his journey finally arrived where he's going. And in 2 Timothy, he opens in chapter one. And this is what he says down towards the middle in verse 12. And this is, this is, this is so powerful for anybody in the tension today. He said, that is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed. Listen to this, because I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced, here comes our heartbeat, that he is what? Able to do what? To guard what? I have entrusted to him for that day. In other words, I believe at the end of the story, it's going to resolve in beautiful restoration. And even though I might not see all that and how it's working, I've entrusted certain things to God for that day. And I believe in the one that I have entrusted things to. And I am convinced that he is able to keep what I have entrusted to him against that day. We sing in this gathering, my sins are forgiven and my future is heaven. I don't know if we believe that or not, but if we really do, that's grace on display and worship erupting. But it is confidence that when this story resolves, my future is going to resolve with it in heaven. And everything I've entrusted to God for that day, I'm convinced he is able to keep it all. 
The bank of Yahweh isn't going under. But that begs the question today, what have you entrusted to God for that day? Because this is not an all skate. This message is not an all skate today. This word coming around the globe today is not an all skate. It is not a word to everybody hearing me today that you can be sure that whatever happens at the end of the day, you're going to be good with God. This verse is saying, have you opted in by faith in Jesus to understand who God is, join a relationship with Yahweh, start on a journey of following Jesus, and then start entrusting things to the one who can hold everything dear to you so that in the day when everything resolves and time and space all are made clear, everything you had hoped for in your wildest dreams and desires would be safe with God on that day. This is not a little plaque you buy at the card shop and put up on the wall and say, I'm good, I'm covered. No, this is for people who've taken an act of entrusting something to God and saying, I believe you, that when the tension resolves, the impossible is going to appear. And then lastly, I think it's great to remember that the tension, your tension will resolve. It will resolve in ultimate restoration. Your tension will resolve in ultimate restoration. If you are committed to him and have entrusted to him, if you are believing in him and have put your hope in him, if it is not just some kind of a cover in case this thing is all real. I'm going to pray a prayer and hope for the best, but you really genuinely are putting your life in the hands of Jesus. I'm telling you, it all resolves in ultimate restoration. That's why this message is called the ultimate impossibility. Because he says about him that it was impossible for death to keep its grip on him. Do you believe that? That he's going to be rescued from, how did Paul write it? From the agony of death, from the enduring death, from the death that progresses on ultimately to decay. No, he is not gonna be able to be held by the grip of that kind of death. He's going to see a resolution ultimately of restoration. And for Jesus, that was three days in the tomb and then it was resurrection. It was days on earth proclaiming his resurrection and then it was reunification with Almighty God. It was restoration of his throne, restoration of his authority, restoration of his power, restoration of his crown, his feet now on a stool, his, his robe now filling up the temple, his name now resounding in authority. For him, it was restoration back to the place where he started when he entered into the plan. But for you, it may be another season. But I'm telling you, death ultimately cannot keep its hold on you. Your future is not decay. Your future is restoration by the power of Almighty God. So if you're in the tension today, I invite you, start with possibility. And know that you'll never get less if you say in that, I believe you're the God of miracles, but I want to submit and surrender to your will and plan. I'll get out of the boat and try to walk on the water. If I go under, I'll just get back up and say, well, praise God, what's next? I'm going to live with a mindset that starts with God is able. Therefore, I'm going to keep entrusting to him everything near and dear to me. And I'm going to believe God for a miracle. And I believe I'm going to see the impossible in the end.